for tuning in to Manage the Moment, Conversations in Performance Psychology. I'm Dr. Sari Shepard. I want to connect with the audience and, and make this two hours of coverage on this basketball game I'm doing or whatever it is as enjoyable as possible. And you do that by making them want to spend the time with you. And that's kind of the last thought I have before I go on the air is make that person out there enjoy the next two hours, however I can do that. Terry Gannon knows how to make a broadcast entertaining, but he also knows how to close out a championship game as an All-American. You will recognize Terry as a voice from NBC Sports and the Golf Channel, but you'll probably have heard him call everything from NBA basketball to figure skating to horse racing to supercross, World Cup soccer, and even the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. Terry Gannon knows a great deal about managing high-pressure moments, and he shares his experience with us on today's episode. And I think you're really going to enjoy listening to what he has to say. Hi, Terry. Thanks so much for joining me today for this conversation. Sari, I'm really looking forward to it. Good to be with you. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it as well. I, I have a short list of broadcasters that I um, admire the most in terms of style, and you're on the, the short list. Um, <laughs> but also, I... Thank I, you. Absolutely. I also appreciate what you have to say because you talk a lot more about the mental game than perhaps most other broadcasters. Uh, and I wonder if that's because of your experience as an athlete. I think it probably is. Um, I, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, these are all, when you, when you cover whether it's the Women's British Open or the, the, the Open Championship or you're doing Simone Biles, you know, at the U.S. Gymnastics Championships or the NBA or college basketball, you're talking the greatest athletes in the world, what separates them? They're all great, you know, I mean, they've made it to the highest level. And oftentimes what separates them is the mental part of the game. And having played basketball and, and been a part of a national championship team and played for a guy, Jim Valvano, who was just a master at motivating teams, um, the mental side of it really is something that I think is as important or more important than anything. And I think it, it comes from being a player and having been through it and having had to prepare and believe in yourself and get to that point where you believe you can get it done as a player. And, and I kind of think that way as a broadcaster now when I watch these athletes. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about your experience both as an athlete at, and as a broadcaster. But when we were preparing for the conversation um, today, you mentioned that you had read a sports psychology book back in the day when applied sports psychology really came into its modern form, um, a book called Psycho Cybernetics yeah. by Maxwell Maltz. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you remember from that book and, and why it stuck out to you. I was in high school and a basketball player, a baseball player eventually um, went and played at NC State. But somebody recommended that book to me and I read it and it just totally, I, I connected with it. It, it. it was something that I went, oh my gosh, this, this is something that actually can help me. And as you know, I mean, it, I think it was written in 1960. So this was the, the 80s when I read it. Um, and I, I started to apply it. Uh, the, the thought of visualization and trying to visualize in the most concrete way, really putting yourself in a position of what it's going to feel like on the court the next day. Um, the sounds, the smells, every little bit. Not just trying to visualize yourself making jump shots, but literally down to the, the sensory aspect of it and getting as relaxed as you can uh, before you go to sleep every night. I would do it every night in, in high school and then in college as an athlete. As I fell asleep, i try to visualize in the most relaxed state that I could because you're your mind on some level doesn't recognize the difference between a real and an imagined experience when, for example, you wake up in a cold sweat having had a nightmare, it feels so real. And, and that made sense to me. And I, so I started to practice it and, and I just did it throughout my career as an athlete and I still do it as a broadcaster. I was going to ask you, do you imagine yourself in the different situations that you have when you're broadcasting? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I can't say I do it as much now. Um, I'm getting up there. I've been around for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> but certainly early on in my career as a broadcaster, I, uh, I was offered, I, I, I was, had such good fortune 
to be in a situation where I was at, at the time, at ABC Sports, and they would come to me and say, hey, we need you to go do figure skating next week in Tokyo. And I'd say, okay, I've never done figure skating. I know who Peggy Fleming is, and that's about the extent of my knowledge. Oh, you'll be fine. So that's, there's that brief moment where you go, oh, my God, I can't do this. This is going to be a disaster. Or you say, hey, somebody's got to do it. And that, that attitude, I, I must say, was instilled in me from Jim Valvano at NC State. He was just, he, he believed that somebody has to do it, why not you? And it was that attitude which allowed me to say yes, but then you had to figure out how to do it. And what I would do, and, and the same thing with college football on a Tuesday, uh, the executive producer of ABC called me up and said, hey, this Saturday, I need you to do play-by-play on North Carolina and Georgia Tech on the network. And I said, well, it's not basketball season. No, no, football. Um, oh, okay. So in, in, in four days, I need to figure out how to be a football play-by-play guy. And, and so it was, you do a lot of things to prepare, but then I would visualize and I, and I would um, spend that time putting myself in that position. So I still do it today, maybe not as much, but I, I try to... Um, capture what it's going to be like the next day on the air, what we're going to be covering, so that I've been through it in my mind already once when it actually takes place. It's great that you recognize the benefit of that mental rehearsal. And, and now we know through technology over the decades since that book was written from MF, fMRI studies that the brain really does um, recognize the stimulus of mental imagery in much the same way as as live action. So so what you experienced and, and what you felt was true has been has been proven true through science. Um, but I, when you think about preparing for sports that you have not called before, you you go online, you research the the sport, you get a little bit about the terminology, but then you, there's still that sense of performance pressure. I, I would imagine because you, you have to get it right. You're right, uh, and and that is exactly what you do. Um, when I started doing gymnastics. Uh, the first thing you do is you go online and you watch tape uh, of previous events and you figure out the, the, the wording, the nomenclature, how, how people cover it, the pacing of it, and you get that in your brain. Then you start to do your research on the current stars and athletes, the ones that came before, the history of it, and you take all that in. But then you've got to put yourself in that position. And no matter what sport you're doing, you're covering, the one thing I try to remind myself, and and this is something I do before I go on the air every time, is that what I want to do is I want to connect with the audience and and make this two hours of coverage on this basketball game I'm doing or whatever it is, as enjoyable as possible. And you do that by making them want to spend the time with you. In the end, you are still covering sports. It's entertainment. It's not life or death. And that's kind of the last thought I have before I go on the air is make that person out there enjoy the next two hours, however I can do that. And oftentimes that's by connecting to the, the broadcast partners that you're with and, and making it conversational, engaging them, picking their brains because oftentimes it's, I, I look at it as, <clears throat> like last weekend, we're covering the gymnastics championships. It's Nasty Luke and Tim Daggett and me. They are the experts. They know more than 95% of the audience or 99% of the audience. And they've been there and done that. I want to engage as three people watching this event in a conversation as if we're just talking about it and we're excited about it. And because of their knowledge, the viewer is going to learn as well and enjoy it more. Um, and I think that's the same as an, for an athlete too. When I was an athlete, the last thing I thought about was making this a celebration of basketball. I'm gonna go out there and have fun um, and, and do what I've always done. Once you know you can do it, like once you get a certain level where, okay, I can, I can do this, then that last bit is just saying, let's let it all happen. Let's not force anything. Let it come to us. And that's what stands out to me about you as a broadcaster is that you are more in the moment 
than many broadcasters that I watch or listen to. And I know that you prepare, you clearly do, but you also allow that preparation seemingly to to give you more of a sense of freedom. Would you say that's true? I really thank you for saying that. I'm glad and you picking up on that, I appreciate. That means a lot to me because I try to that's exactly what I try to do. It is the last unscripted television. I mean, yes, reality shows, but let's be honest, they're scripted to some degree. Sports is not scripted. You do not know what's going to happen. Even in a sport like figure skating or gymnastics, where you have a routine and there's a planned routine, but the athletes got to adjust as well on the fly. If they, if they don't do this triple later on, they've got to add it, but maybe with a combination and they're constantly adjusting. And as a broadcaster, that's what I want to convey the, the aspect of being in the moment. So like, at the end of an event, when it comes down to the defining moment at the end of a game or a golf tournament, I don't ever prepare a line like that, that okay, I'm going to say this. this. If this person wins the golf tournament, I'm going to say this. I, I, I let it hit me when we're on the air. I'll, I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Hanako Shibuno, who was a young teenager playing in her first major championship in the Women's British Open. And they call her the Smiling Cinderella uh, in, in Japan. And she is. She's, she smiles and laughs her way around 72 holes for four days around the golf course. And she's waving like she's in the Rose Parade the whole time, left and right to all the, the crowd. And, and when she won it, it, she made this incredible putt to win it. And I said something to the effect of the, the glass slipper fits. Well, it just hit me because when we won the national championship in 1983, our radio announcer, because we were the Cinderella story, that's what he said. But it, but it hit me in the moment. Oh, my God, it applies here. Boom. And um, hopefully uh, that it came across as real and in the moment and off the cuff because it was. But I, I'd much rather, even if I don't come up with the greatest line, I'd much rather be in the moment than have scripted that. And that makes for good broadcasting. I, and I think that, that experienced broadcasters try to allow that freedom to, to occur. For example, the, the line in The Miracle on Ice. I mean, who, who can forget that? And that was an unscripted moment. But, but I think um, you're living out the principles that you first read about way back in the 80s because psycho-cybernetics does talk about that. Um, Max Maltz says that you should just focus on doing one thing at a time and that, that um, you should live in the present moment and release all thought about outcome of your creative activity. And it sounds like you really try to do that. Yeah, I do. And, and um, that is, I guess, where I first kind of learned it and thought about it. Um, when I went from high school to the ACC, it was kind of a golden age in, in the ACC and college basketball. I mean, all of, all of a sudden you, you, you're on the floor and you find yourself guarding Michael Jordan. And right. it, it occurs to you, I can't guard Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then you're playing against Sam uh, Perkins and James Worthy and Ralph Sampson. And the logical part of your brain says, you know, I'm good, but I, I'm not as good as these guys. But what you, what you do, or what I did at least, is I said, look, just play basketball. And I realized it's, it's basketball. It's what I've done all my life. Just go play and do the things you, you know how to do. Um, and then you get to a point where you believe, hey, I, I can do this. I, I can hang. Um, but it is about letting it happen and being in the moment, too. Uh, because even the visualization, the, the night before or the day of or what, whenever you're doing that, um, it's kind of, that's kind of unscripted too. Everything you want to be positive, but you let that happen too. You don't script it per se. And you're using mental imagery to help calm yourself as well, I would imagine, just to, to try to reduce the fear and the worry um, and just execute the skill that you, you know that you have. When, when you were just speaking um, just now, it sounded like that's where you put your mind is on the skill that you know you have and, and what you control about what you bring to the situation rather than things that you can't control. Yeah, I, I, yeah, abso absolutely. Um, you know, and, and what we're talking about has gotten so big in athletics, but 
I cover a lot of golf and it's, it's gotten huge in golf where everybody's got a, a sports psychiatrist or psychologist working with them um, to do just that, to, to worry about the process. And we get, sometimes it gets trite and it sounds cliche when an athlete says that in an interview. Well, I'm just taking it one step at a time and I'm going one shot by one shot. But it is psychologically, at least, about that because you, you can't control the outcome. You can control the process and being in that moment fully to pull off the best shot that you can pull off at that time or playing college basketball against Michael Jordan. If, if you think about the outcome, well, you're going to immediately go to, yeah, he's the greatest player of all time. This is not good. Um, <laughs> you, 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 ha- you have to control what you can control and get open for that jump shot and, and take it just like you're taking it against anybody else or on the golf course, you know, that, that bunker shot, that fairway bunker shot from 180 yards over water. You, you can't think about the outcome. You got to think about the process in order to pull that off. Um, and we've gotten, you, you know much more than I, and I, I'd love to pick your brain um, about where we've come with that since the days of psycho-cybernetics and Maxwell Maltz. But I do think watching the greatest athletes in the world, all of those principles still apply that were laid down back then. Absolutely. And of course, I would be somebody who would 100% agree with you. Um, and, it, and we have really advanced the field quite a lot, especially with applied research and, and with the technology that we use. Um, but, but a lot of it still comes down to the same principles you just discussed, which is being in the moment. Uh, executing what's in front of you, staying staying there in that process. And uh, it's more difficult to do sometimes than other times, um, but it's it's never um, it, it's it's never lessened in its importance. You really have to focus your mind on the things that you can control and stay with that process. So building the process for each athlete is going to look different, um, but it, it's important across the board, regardless of sport, regardless of whether it's a team sport, individual sport, um, the mental side of the game is is so important. And you know what? There, there are also, I played with, and now I have covered athletes who just don't seem to get the situation they're in and how much pressure they should feel. Like it's, it, it's yeah. just a natural thing for some athletes. They have such be- either belief in themselves or... Uh, single-minded focus where it doesn't even hit them that they're supposed to feel pressure in this moment. (laughs) And and I marvel at that. And then there are other athletes who absolutely get every aspect of that and work hard taking themselves to a place where they're in the moment. Yeah, and it is going to be different for every athlete because sometimes it's really hard work to stay in the moment. And, And you really have to work the process hard. And you have to trust the process and respect it and embrace it, but you really have to work it hard. And for other athletes, they're, they're able to narrow their attention and their focus to their skill and to that moment with seeming ease. And so it, it does vary person to person. Um, I'm glad you point that out. But, but, but I would say that seems like what you experience when you're broadcasting is you don't, you don't seem to... I'm not sure about your experience, but you don't seem to notice the pressure of the situation. I mean, you've you've called the Rose Parade, motocross, college basketball and football, World Cup soccer, ski jumping, the Indy 500, <laughs> rugby, cycling, WNBA, Tour de France, Belmont Stakes. You worked on the wide world of sports with Jim McKay. Of course, folks today know you as a regular with Judy Rankin calling the LPGA and then the PGA alongside Sir Nick Faldo oftentimes, um, but you also called the closing ceremonies of the Olympic Games. And to me, you seemed no more nervous in that situation than in any other um, and seemed to just rely on the, the preparation and the skill that you bring to any situation. <laughs> Thank you for running down the bio, too. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm worn out now listening to that. Um, yeah, you know, when I'm, when I'm nervous, our... our the days leading up when it's something that I haven't done before. If it's the closing ceremony at the Olympics because it's such a different animal. Or back in the day, you do the Indianapolis 500 for the first time. And in the days leading up, you're, you're trying to learn as much as you can and, and get it all down. 
I knock on wood, <laughs> but in the moments before the broadcast, somehow a calm comes over me, and it's it's like you switch into a mode that I've done this a million times. Whatever sport it is or whatever I'm covering, I got this, and I I don't fully understand where that comes from. And it's also the time where I get most excited about going on the air. It, it's, I, I just get excited when the producer is counting down 10, 9, 8, and until that red light goes on. Um, I, I think it's a sense, if I could put my finger on it, it's a sense of competition. I, I just love competition, people competing especially at the highest level, but it, maybe even not at the highest level. I mean, if you're calling a, a high school game, that, that, that moment before the game starts, the anticipation, and I just, I just get excited. I don't get nervous. Um, you thrive on that intensity. Yeah, and, and it, it's what really gets me going about my job, no matter what. It, it, it's what makes that ride to the airport or getting on the rental car bus hauling my bags all over the place mm -hmm. worth it is is that moment when you actually go on the air and you're it, it's all about to unfold in front of you and you don't know how it's going to come out what the outcome is going to be well but you trust yourself enough to be in the moment right because yeah. it's, it's it's not that you've never made a mistake in your career i would imagine but you trust yourself enough to know that you'll be able to to get through it or to recover or to, to tune back into what's happening in the moment so that you can stay with it. Make a mistake at least every time out. Um, <laughs> but that the other aspect of that too, I think is owning up to it and immediately just saying, Oh, sorry about that. Uh, this is the case or that's the case. Misspoke. Uh, I, people forgive you people. Right. I, I think as, as a viewer, as I watch sports, um, first of all, I'm, I'm I'm able to watch sports and not critique the announcers all the time, thank goodness, because it would drive me crazy. I'd never watch. <laughs> um, but the ones that I really like are the ones who are just honest, like you're sitting on the couch next to them. And if they make a mistake, they just own up to it and correct it right away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think fans are very forgiving that way. I think when you try to cover it up or act like you didn't make a mistake is when they're going to actually hold it against you. Um, but, but you've it, also hit on, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, you've also hit on another key of the mental side of things is that you don't judge yourself. When you spend time judging yourself, criticizing yourself, you, you lose focus in, in the moment of, of what you're paying attention to. And, and you stay on that mistake a little bit longer. Your turnaround time, so to speak, is, is longer. So you're not able to get right back in it. So the fact that you don't judge yourself for making a mistake, instead, you just own up to it and move on. Yeah, and, your performance. Yeah, and you tell me, I mean, I, I think a big part of that is having been an athlete too because that's exactly what you have to do when you, you're on the court or you're on the field. I mean, you don't have time to dwell on it. Absolutely. Or if you do, um, you're going to compound the mistake. And, and the toughest sports to me are the ones with so, like golf, for example. There's so little time spent actually in the activity of playing golf. The swing, the putt, most of the time you spend in that four and a half hours, and unfortunately it's like five hours plus now, the way rounds are taking, but it, almost the entire time it's in between the activity. And that's the biggest challenge, I think, in, like for golfers to let go of that last shot, that last bad shot, or that last bogey on the uh, previous hole. Um, but it's, it's maybe the biggest thing in terms of success on the golf course. But I think it applies to all sports. And, I, and having played, you know, you, you turn the ball over leading to a dunk for another, another team. I mean, you've got to snap right back in and forget about that. And, and the athletes with the, the least amount of memory are the most successful ones that I've encountered. Right, absolutely. And I think one of the reasons why people say that golf is such a mental game is because there is more time in between shots when you're on the basketball court, you don't have time. You ha you have to turn around, run the other way. Yeah. Uh, um, but in golf, you have a number of minutes between shots that take 
somewhere between 30 to 45 seconds to, you know, to execute in total. So absolutely. And, and yeah, yeah basketball is a reactive sport. Most of the time mm -hmm. you're out there reacting in golf. You're not doing that. You're, you're literally thinking about either your last shot or your next shot. And hopefully it's mostly your next shot. Um, and one of the great advances we've had in TV, I think are the, the microphones to be able to pick up conversations between caddies and players or between two players as they're walking up to their next shot. And some fans say, oh, it's kind of boring. What do I want to listen to a caddy? I think it's fascinating because- Oh, it, I love it. it. Yeah, it totally takes you into, it's not only coach player and that conversation, it takes you into the mindset of that player. And are they thinking about that last shot or are they thinking about this next putt or how are they thinking about this next putt? And I often think that the most successful players are the ones who, when you pick up that conversation, um, they're they're probably they're they're talking about things other than the next shot until they get up to the ball and are taking a look at now you click in to your situation and what you're going to do and then you click in to your pre-shot routine, which again that's part of the whole in basketball as a free throw shooter, for example. Um, it, it, I learned this early on. You you have a routine, and as soon as you're handed the ball, you're not thinking about anything except what you do every single time you go to the free throw line. Boom, 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 four bounces, look, bend, shoot, whatever your routine is. And it's the same in, in golf, and I think the, the best, most successful golfers are the ones who are taking their mind away from what's going on, and then they click in when they get there. You're doing such a great job of describing sports psychology. Really, you are. Um, a, a lot of the key principles that you mentioned are, are just so true and unchanging, depending on the, the sport or the generation or whatever it might be. It's it, these, these principles don't change. But in golf, when you have a four or five hour round, and then it's played over maybe four days, three or four days, depending, by the, by the time you get to the back nine on the last round, your mind is going to be exhausted if you're thinking about golf the entire time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're gonna lose your ability just to make the best course decisions, um, or feel like you're still there, you know, in the tournament because you're just gonna be exhausted. So you're right. I think players that when they're walking in between holes, they put their mind on something else, uh, and then when it comes time, when you actually get up to the ball and you you see where it lie and you address the ball and and get ready to take your put your best swing on it, um, and you then you switch to having your mind back in the game. I think. That makes for a good combination. I think I really, also over the ahead. course of days too, because it, you, you play a four day event. Yeah. Um, you better, once you leave the golf course that night or afternoon, you better get away from it and, yeah. and not really think about it until that next day. Uh, now, if you got to work out something, you, you got to head to the range and work out a little something in your swing that you're not feeling fine, go do that, but then leave it and, and go out to dinner or go out and do whatever with your buddies or, or and, and it goes back as, as a basketball player, and if, if people know about Jim Valvano and maybe watched our 30 for 30 uh, survive in advance uh, about 1983 and our run to a championship, he was a coach that wanted you. We went to the Final Four. He wanted us to take in everything about the Final Four, take, and go to practice with 10,000 people there, and, and don't be shielded off. We're not going to go practice in some little gym with no one there because he wanted us to take all that in and experience it. He wanted us to go out at night. He, I mean, his joke was, yeah, we had bed check last night. We checked at 10 o'clock. All the beds were there. All the beds were there. I remember that. Right. And, and, and for me, I mean, I think that was a reason we pulled off a great upset then because, um, we got away from it. You weren't sitting there and thinking about it. There are some coaches who, you know, you got film session and then you go and you have a closed practice and they want you to go right back to your rooms and, and uh, not be out and about. And I, I think that makes it harder. I think that puts more pressure on you as an athlete than the opposite. It does. Absolutely. And let, but let's switch a little bit to your uh, career as a, as a collegiate basketball player, because 
depending on the generation um, of the listeners, some may not know that you were part of something that some consider one of the greatest sports seasons, one of the greatest sports moments, in fact, in college basketball history. And you played for and later worked as an assistant coach for the great Jim Valvano. And I'm sure that it's hard to encapsulate what you learned about the mental game from him. Um, but maybe you can recall some of the things that he discussed on the mental side of the, of the game. Yeah, he, he was just the, the most impressive person I've ever been around. And I miss him every day. And I miss being able to call him up and saying, hey, did you see my broadcast yesterday? What'd you think? And, and picking his brain. He was one of those people who just, first of all, had an enthusiasm for life, was excited every, and I was close to him. I not only worked for him as an assistant coach, but that was very close to him uh, until he passed and, and still close with his family and would spend a lot of time with him. And he, he was excited about every minute that he was alive and he was into everything. He was a his, um, English major in college and in halftime talks, he would quote great poets and authors and he was into business. He had a number of side businesses. He was into sculpture and, and, and art and he, he started a business in, in that way. And um, he was the kind of guy who made you believe you could do anything and not with a rah, rah, Newt Rockney talk but because he believed in you, he got that across and you didn't want to let him down. And he made you feel like you could, you could accomplish anything and, and, um, and take on any task. I mean, really, the entire reason that I kept saying yes every time an opportunity came my way in broadcasting to do something that I had never thought about was because he instilled the idea of... of why not? And why not me? Um, and he did that in the locker room before the championship game. We were taking on Houston, who had two future Hall of Fame players, and Akeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler. And we were a mm -hmm. major underdog. I think my dad even laid the points and took Houston that night. <laughs> um, <laughs> we weren't supposed to even stay with them. And, and he came in the locker room. And, and I, we tell this story kind of in the 30 for 30. Sorry if people saw it and I'm boring them. But, we had, you know, you have the entire scouting report up on the board and everything that you're going to do against this defense and that defense. And here's how we're going to guard them. And, 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 he, and he took an eraser and he erased the entire thing. And he threw it away. And he said, if you think we're going to hold the ball and slow it down in front of 50 million people, you're crazy. We're going to go out there and kick their ass and, and everybody just jumped up and that was the entire pregame speech and it was perfect because what we needed to hear from him was that he believed in us and he believed we were going to win and we were going to find a way to do it somehow get us to two minutes left with a chance to win the game and we're going to find a way again being in that moment and letting it happen and um he 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 slept about four hours a night he was mm -hmm. on all the time if you're in the same room with him, you had to bring your A game conversation wise or, or he would just take you down. Um, mm -hmm. He was just to be around. He was he motivated you every single second. And I always left after spending time with him more excited and motivated about life. And it's led to me accepting opportunities that I would have never accepted. Yeah, you mentioned that he would say to you, don't limit yourself, keep your mind and your eyes wide open for any opportunity. And it, and it seems like that's exactly what you've done. That's how we lived. And, and um, you know, I, I, I would have never believed in myself to the extent that I, I have without having had a coach like him. And he was said, so you talk about the uh, psychological aspect of sports and, and the mindset of athletes. He, he wasn't, um, educated that way, he he just knew what button to push. And that button's different for everyone on the team. That's the other thing. He didn't treat us all the same. He treated us based on our personalities and needs as players and people. And he had a different relationship with every player. Um, and I think that's important for coaches too when they, they, they coach at the highest level with athletes. Not to treat everybody the same. Different players need different motivation. I mean, I, I know I played with players who needed 
to be motivated to work hard. And I played with players who just needed to be told they were good enough. Um, and he believed that they could get this done or that done. And, and you, it's not all the same. And, and I think even when you're an accomplished athlete at the highest level, you're a professional athlete, um, I, I think that's true as well. Well, he did bring out the best in you, considering you led that uh, led the nation in three-point shooting that, that year, um, three-point shooting percentage. So something s- certainly worked in terms of him being able to bring out the best in you. But one, one thing about your relationship with Jim Valvano is um, in contrast to your role as a broadcaster, where you seem to always have something really fitting to say um, about coach Jimmy Valvano, you said that you don't talk a lot about him because you don't feel like you have the words to really do him justice. And you don't know exactly how to describe everything that he was. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever known a person like that. Um, hopefully you have. And, and I, if I try to get across to you even right now, what he was like, I'll, for, I'll fall short. I, I mean, I, I'm, I do my best to, because I think I'd like people to know um, how extraordinary he was. And, you know, he was, I mean, I went to see him a few times when he was in the hospital at Duke battling cancer at his worst. And, um, he, you know, he'd have to hit the button for painkillers and fall asleep and he wouldn't want to. But he would wake up, and, and every moment, he's telling me, all right, here's what we need to do. He, he was setting up the V Foundation for cancer research, literally, mm. as he's laying in the bed dying and, and mm. saying, Frank's going to do this, and, and Bobby's going to do this, and here's what I want you to do. And he set up, he, he, he envisioned and literally set up the entire V Foundation as he was dying of cancer, and it's now, you know, over $200 million. They built wings on hospital. They've saved lives. It's, it's really one of those places saved one of his daughter's life who, who mm. has had cancer. So it's, um, he, he was just one of those guys who you can't fully capture when you talk about. A couple of weeks ago, but right, well, about a month ago, I, I played uh, in the ESPYs golf tournament with uh, a friend who was a very good friend of Jim Valvano's and we spent the entire day talking about him because he understood him and knew him and I did and you can talk about that if I spent the entire day trying to tell people about him I don't think I can I think I'd always fall short of capturing him I think not having the words to describe somebody in and of itself is is an amazing testament to who somebody means and uh, um, what they mean to you, I mean, and uh, who, who they were in your life. Um, one of the things you seem not to do is, is give into pressure to say something when nothing needs to be said, which is not always easy. But I, I noticed that in your approach to your work is if there's an intense moment, you let the moment speak for itself. And I think you're letting uh, Coach V's career and personality and, and impact speak for itself as well. But um, I'm drawing parallels just in your approach to your work that sometimes you know that not saying something is the right thing to do. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, here's the thing. Um, in, in, when, when there's a great moment and the crowd goes nuts and everybody, what am I going to say to add to that to make it better? <laughs> right? I, I mean, y- yeah, later, the temptation is later on to have that piece of tape where you called, you have this great call over a great shot or a great moment, but in the moment, just take the people there. Let, let the people watching on TV be there at the golf course in that moment or in the arena at that moment and experience what it's like to be in the crowd there in person watching it. And there's so many times when you do just, you, you should, I think, let it happen and, 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 and just let the moment take over. So hopefully, hopefully I do that for the most part. And I appreciate you saying that. 
No, absolutely. It, but it, it really does stand out. I, there are some broadcasters when I'm listening to certain sports that I'll actually turn down the sound. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I won't, I won't mention names, of course. Well, I'm glad I'm not one of them. Thank <laughs> not you. Not at all. No, when, when I tune into something you're calling, I know that I'm going to enjoy it more. And that's, the, that's really my, my um, true feeling about it. That's the biggest compliment you could pay me. So I appreciate that. And that really is my goal every time out. Well, I'm, I'm happy to pay you a compliment that, um, that is meaningful. Um, one of the, the lines that I wrote down, actually, I, a few years back, um, when you were calling the, uh, the free dance at the U.S. Olympics, you were watching the champions perform in their, um, I think it was their short program, and you said their, their brilliance doesn't bring you out of your seat. It makes you sit back and contemplate it. And I wish, of course, I had said that more fluidly. But um, when, you, <laughs> when you said that line, um, I thought it's, it was true. It was 100% true. There's some sports that you watch and you just want to jump out of your seat. You can't sit still. You have to pace the room if you're someone like me. Um, and there's other times where you watch and you're simply in awe and you have to just think about what you just saw. And I think that uh, Simone Biles triple double at the 2019 USA Gymnastics Championships is one of those moments where you just have to sit and take stock of what just happened. There's nothing else you can do but just be in awe. I was totally in awe in the moment the other night when she did that, even though I knew she was going to attempt that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think she is one of, those, one of those rare athletes that doesn't just impress you or make you cheer. She, she literally makes your jaw just drop um, because you can't believe what she's doing. And I actually posted something on Twitter just because it hit me. Uh, having played in college with Spud Webb, <clears throat> excuse me, who is 5'6", maybe 5'7", mm -hmm. and eventually won the slam dunk contest in the NBA uh, in 1986. He, he was the kind of athlete, and after practice every day, he would just put on a dunking show. <laughs> just, just, I mean, he would do things, and he would sit there. Everybody on the team would just sit there along the sideline and watch him, <clears throat> excuse me, and just be in awe. And... It's the closest thing to what I saw the other night happen with Simone Biles. You, you, I, I want to keep watching her. I don't want her to leave the mat. I, I want her to be on floor the entire time or on beam the entire time. And no disrespect to anybody else competing, but she is that kind of once-in-a-lifetime athlete who does things that you don't think should be humanly possible. Um, and you just kind of take that in and hopefully we ran enough replays and for people to uh, <laughs> to appreciate it. But it got I know it got enough play because I came home the next day uh, and every I mean, I, my mailman was talking about it. My dentist was talking about it. Everybody was talking about what she had done the night before. And she's four foot eight powerhouse. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> Incredible. Yes. Yeah. And also Spud Webb. I I, um, I remember him, too. I was young at the time, but I remember just what a powerhouse he was and the, the show that he would put on. My husband, as a matter of fact, was in the pit. Um, the really? That you won the, yeah, the day that you won the national championship. Um, and and so it, it's funny now, just looking back when I was watching the um, the 30 for 30, the Survive in Advance that you, that you mentioned earlier. That's an ESPN film, by the way, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with 30 for 30, I really recommend you look it up and watch it. It's, it's um, a great piece. Uh, but when when you mentioned what year it was and where where the the final four took place, I had forgotten that, and so I asked my husband, "Is that the year that you were at the final four?" And cer certainly it was. So it's pretty funny. That is really cool. That, I yeah. mean, I mean, about a hundred million people claim to have been there that night now, but I be <laughs> but I believe them. I, I do. I believe them. <laughs> It's funny that the 30 for 30 actually has been a great thing. I, I you know, we did that um, and we went back to Raleigh and we went to a place that we used to hang out and they just turned on the cameras and the microphones and there was, they didn't say anything like we want you to talk about this or that or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we just talked as teammates for four hours and uh, they took it all and, and made a great uh, special out of it. But it was, we, we get together as a team Every couple of years, and within five seconds, 
it's it's like it was back in the early 80s where you know same guys getting made fun of for the same things and same mm-hmm. same guys who were leaders back then are leaders still now and uh, i think one of the reasons and wherever i go covering things people stop me and tell me that they they love that 30 for 30 is um it's a bunch of guys who just were very close and and were able to pull off something extraordinary what an amazing experience you had um and an amazing career you continue to have and i i could talk to you all day but i don't want to Uh, keep you much longer. I do have some questions that I ask everyone. Um, So if it's okay, I'm going to shift to those and and get your answers. Sure. This has been great, by the way. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad, Terry. Um, So Terry, what in life are you still curious about? I'm still curious about where life's going to take me. I feel like I'm just starting and I don't don't know what my next journey is. Um, And I'm open to wherever it takes me. So you're still heeding um, Coach Fee's words then, apparently. Yeah. And people ask me, well, so how long are you going to do this? I'm like, I haven't even thought about not doing this. I, I want to know what's next. What What's on the docket next for me? That's great. What is more distracting to you as a, as a broadcaster, the praise that you get or the criticism? Uh, well, I'm going to be really honest. And I'd love to say the criticism doesn't bother me, but we're all human. It, it, you can have 25 good comments and then there's one who said, why did you say this when this happened? And then you rethink it a million times. So uh, I, anybody who says that doesn't bother them, I, I don't know if I believe them. And so then I'll just follow up with that really quickly. How do you get yourself over it? You get on your horse again the next time and you go do it. Um, I think that comes from being an athlete. That what we talked about, I think it's you forget about your last swing or your last shot that didn't go in or your last comment that wasn't on the mark. And thankfully, you have another opportunity the next week to go back out and prove yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. As a performer, you obviously prepare for every broadcast, um, yet the unexpected can happen. What is something unexpected that happened to you as a broadcaster? Oh, wow. Well, the unexpected happens every show. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of sports. Uh, you, you don't know what to expect. Um, oh, I'd have to give that some real thought. Um, I don't know. I'll get back to you. I mean, okay. literally, literally, a few weeks ago at the Women's British Open, this, this yeah. rookie who's never been in a major championship, everybody just assumed... Okay, over the weekend, she's going to fall back. Up oh, in the final round, she can't hang with the pressure. And then when, when she, she makes a birdie putt from like 20 feet on the green at 18 to win it at the end, I mean, I think you can kind of hear it in my voice how unexpected it was that, that she actually pulled this off. So that's, that's the beauty of what I do for a living. And talk about poise under pressure. She was amazing. She just smiled, had fun, seemed to not take it so seriously, which is often a key to success in, in high pressure situations. I know. I, and, and somehow was able to keep doing that. Uh, yeah. the, back to your big, uh, big picture part of your question, though. So much of my career as a broadcaster is unexpected to me. Mm-hmm. I didn't, first of all, expect to be a broadcaster. I was going to be a coach. Oh, that's right. Your dad was a coach. My dad was a coach. That's what I always wanted to do. I was an assistant coach for Jim Valvano. And the opportunity presented itself, <coughs> excuse me, um, to go into broadcasting. And I kind of went in and talked to him. Long story short, uh, he was like, yeah, I'll hire you back. Go take a shot. See what you can do. And it was that was his attitude. And um, that's how I got into broadcasting. And then every step of the way, and I know there's merit to mapping out your future and having goals. But with me, it was more of a dream than a goal. Like I didn't say one day I want to be sitting courtside calling the NBA playoffs or the Final Four or something. I I said, this is a great journey. Let me see where it takes me. And I was open to accepting opportunities because of that in areas that I never would have accepted. If, if I mapped it out, I would have never said, yes, I'll go do that figure skating show next week. Yes, 
I'll do play by play this weekend on college football. Yes, I'll go do mountain biking for Wide World of Sport. Yes, I'll do ski flying in Slovenia next week. <laughs> and and so however that was instilled, and I think a big part of it was Jim Valvano, um I feel fortunate for that. And the whole thing is unexpected. And that's why I kind of say and, and I'm being truthful, I don't know where the journey takes me next. That's cool. And even your championship, of course, was unexpected. It was unexpected by everyone who was watching, including all the, the broadcasters who were calling the, the tournament back then. Um, but, but each time you advanced, your team got a little bit more confident that if you could just be in, in the game with three minutes left, you'd find a way to win. But when you started off, I, I imagine just the fact that you were advancing along that journey was something you, you didn't really expect. No way. I mean... Yeah. It, we, we had to, in our minds, we had an injured player, Derek Wittenberg, one of our best players, through the middle of the season. He unexpectedly came back, was able to play, coming back from a broken foot right at the end of the season. But in our minds, we had to win the ACC tournament just to even get into the NCAA tournament, which included beating North Carolina with Michael Jordan and Sam Perkins on Saturday, and then Ralph Sampson, who at the time was hmm. even more of a powerhouse than Michael Jordan in college basketball, we had to beat Virginia on Sunday, and we did it. And and what happened along the way, we won these games in such dramatic fashion coming from behind that we would get in the locker room after the game and kind of look at each other and raise an eyebrow and smile <laughs> and go, how did we do that? And <laughs> and you, what happened along the way is this belief that – I don't know. We'll, who do we have to play next? The Celtics? Okay, we'll find a way to win. We don't know how, but if we're close to the end, we're going to find a way to win. It's just a belief that grew because we did come back and win every game. Yeah, you came from behind. and Yeah, and, um, yeah absolutely. But but how much did that just reinforce the, your confidence that you could do it? If you could perform as a team, if you could um, communicate with each other effectively and, and put all the things that you had practiced into play when it mattered. I'm, I'm sure your confidence just built on, on that experience. Look, I'm not saying, I mean, it could have ended very differently and we could have been blown out by Houston in the championship game. And that was a very real possibility. But in our minds, once Jim Valvano said, you're going to win, this is how you're going to do it, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to be national champions in front of 50 million people. In our minds, it was a done deal. We, we, we were going to win. We didn't know yeah. how. We, we, we'll figure it out, but we're going to win this game. And that's, I, 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 you know, you, whether you're, and it gets back to what we've been talking about the whole time, but it, it's not necessarily tricking your mind into thinking something, but it, but it is finding a way to put that belief in your head and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or it's got more of a chance to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even if it comes down to a lob and a dunk in the last you know, few seconds of a game, um, you've done everything you can to, to prepare for the unexpected and um, you just trust yourself to, to put that into play and, and then, um, show up in the moment. And I love how you call it a lob and a dunk. You're buying Derek <laughs> Wittenberg's story all these years that it wasn't a shot and an air ball right. and a dunk. Uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, and, and who, how ironic if people do know the story because Houston was famous for their dunks. They were five slamma jamma. That's mm -hmm. the, the high flying dunks. And we won the national championship on the final play against them on what? On a dunk. Amazing. Irony. That's how I know my husband was really there because he's not even a basketball fan, but he described the last play. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's proof. <laughs> so back to these uh, these questions. What is one tweet or comment, regardless of the, the means with, with, uh, with which it came to you, um, what is one tweet or comment that stands out to you because of its impact, good, bad, or for whatever reason? <sighs> These are hard. <laughs> these are, these, I know these these are really hard. Um, I don't know. I tend to think of great calls. I don't think in terms of tweets or comments. Sure, sure. You know, sure. I mean, so like Jack Buck, his call with the with Kirk Gibson's home run stands hmm. out. I I don't sure. believe what I just saw, 
And is that poetry? Is that like if you scripted and, and you, you wouldn't make it as simple as that, but it's brilliant because it's so simple and in the moment and it describes what everyone at home is thinking. Yeah, like Jack Nicholas on, um, what was it, 16 at 1986 Masters? Yes, sir. Is yes. Just the, yeah. Vern Lundquist. Yes, right. sir. Uh, or, or Tiger's Chip. In your life, have you yes. ever seen yes. anything like that? Um, it describes exactly what everybody's thinking. And that's what you're hopefully going for as a broadcaster. Terry, how do you move on from failure? Um, and I'm not just talking about a mistake that you make, you know, in and because we've already discussed that. But if you if you feel like you've ever had an experience you walk away from that registers as a failure, how, how do you move on from that? Isn't that the great question of competition or yeah. of success? And, and it is all about that. I, I try. It's, it's not easy, no matter how many years you've been doing what you're doing. But I try to own up to it. Um, I try to analyze it. I, I try to face it and thankfully have another shot. And I try to view everything in, in light of what sports kind of teaches you, which for me, the biggest thing it teaches you is just that is there's always another day. Get back at it, learn from what you just did or failed to do, and come back stronger the next time. Sounds trite, sounds old fashioned, mm. but I think it does all come down to that. And you know, it's what gets me when I would go to, my, my kids are now college age, but would go to their games. Um, parents who don't quite seem to get that, that, that their kid's not gonna be a center fielder for the Dodgers. I mean, if it happens, beautiful, uh, uh, lovely, and it's a you know one in a million shot. And guess what? It's it's going to happen because of the kid, not the parent, most of the times. Yeah. Um, but those those lessons, even as a kid, that these that they're learning, and for me, that's the biggest one: make a mistake, mm -hmm. get back out, and do it better next time. It's the difference between a successful career and a stalled career, often. Yeah, because I think you can you can create that again. It's a, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, and what what's in your mind, oftentimes, either tends to happen, or at least you allow there to be a chance for success. You know the the old thing, uh, belief, hard work, enthusiasm doesn't guarantee success. Doesn't guarantee you're going to win. The, but if you don't have those things, I can guarantee you you won't. It kind of comes down to getting out of your own way sometimes. Yeah, abs yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. That's and that's one of the hardest things to do. Right. Absolutely. Um, this is the last hard one. Um, so <laughs> have you ever had what you would say was a transformative moment in your work? And if so, what was it? Yeah, um, I mean, there there have been many because I've had really opportunities to work with the greatest and, and Jim McKay you mentioned, but I remember, remember Brent Musburger <clears throat> was hosting, we worked with Brent and, and he was the overall host of the, the World Figure Skating Championships and I was the play-by-play -play along with Peggy Fleming and Dick Button. And there are these names, uh, Yelena Beresnaya, Anton Sikorelidze, right? <laughs> who were a Russian pair who eventually yeah. won the Olympic gold medal. But it's hard to say, especially if right. You, you're not used to calling figure skating, and and in the rehearsals, you know he he was he was getting there, but he wasn't quite. And and our producer kept saying, Brent, you got to get these, these names right uh, when we go on the air because figure skating fans know them. Don't worry about it, kid. I got it. <laughs> and <laughs> he, so eventually we go on the air, and they show the standings, and Brent says, "There they are at the top, the Russians." In second place, Smith and Johnson from the United <laughs> States. And, and, and it hit me. That's brilliant. You go with what you know and you stay yeah. away from what you don't. Yeah. And, and really, I mean, it's, a, it's funny, but I learned from that. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Well, it avoids the, the alternative, which is fans yelling at the TV or sending out tweets about how a broadcaster butchered somebody's name, right. like a, a player that they love. So, um, 
but but you pronounce the Thai golf players' last names pretty well, I must say. So Tadapa Sawanapur. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Practice. Say it quickly with conviction. I do. Re- I do remember. I did the Little League World Series, and uh, one time it was Taiwan who was um, in the championship game, and you know you have to go around and set the lineup, and and I did bam 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 with all the names and, and this and that, and after the broadcast. I would always talk to my dad when when he was alive, and he'd say, "Boy, you were so good with those names. You see, you, I mean, you knew every name." I said, "Dad, how would you know if I made a mistake? Seriously?" And <laughs> and, he, and he said, "Well, that's true. I, I really I really wouldn't know, but you said them quickly with conviction." I said, "Yeah, that's all I was trying to do." <laughs> Perfect. Well, in thirty seconds or less, just to sum up, Terry, what have you learned about yourself? from your work as a broadcaster. You are really getting inside my mind now. You're really <laughs> trying to... Um, I've learned that I can accept different challenges and be willing to do the work to try to convey the competition as best I can, no matter what sport it is. I. I I, I, I've learned through the years, and this was something Jim McKay used to say, no matter what sport it is, and he used to do wide world of sports where they'd go do log rolling, you know, and, and it's not exactly um, a mainstream sport. Um, and he'd say, you know, what we're calling today is the world championships. It's the world series to these athletes who are out there competing at this. And... He was right, and it stuck with me. And so I, I've, I've learned that I get excited no matter what the competition is, no matter what the sport is, to watch great athletes compete. Um, and that, you know, also there's some perspective, having, having done it for a while, that um, you celebrate the competition and the athletes even when it maybe is not the greatest competition. I, I try to be honest with the viewer when it's not a great day of golf, they're not playing well, or it's not a great uh, basketball game or whatever it is. And I try to be honest and convey that, but it's still a celebration of what they're doing. And and I've learned that I, pre- I appreciate that as much today as when I started in this business or when I played college sports. And, uh, and it gets me excited. And I, I don't know how many years... I'll do this, but I'm going to do it for a while because I still, every time that game starts, I'm excited. Hmm. Well, I'm very excited to have talked to you today, and maybe this was a little bit of a celebration of, of your career. It's It's been 30-plus years so far in broadcasting. I hope it continues as long as you want it to because regardless of sport, um, you always, at least for me, um, put me right there on the sidelines and, and make me feel like I'm um, watching it from from a, a, a close-up view. Um, and it's always entertaining. It's always interesting. I learn from your broadcasts, which is for someone like me, um, a, a real um, a part of what really draws me to listen to the broadcasts that you cover because I, I love learning. Um, and so I, I enjoy the fact that I can learn from you and I've learned from you today as well. So thank you so much, Terry, for, for joining me today. Thanks for the kind things you've said. I really appreciate it. And, and for the time and allowing me to pick your brain a little bit. And uh, hopefully we can talk along the way. And when I ever have a question in terms of this, I can, I can pick up the phone and call you. So I hope you'll feel free to. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. This has been Manage the Moment with Dr. Shep. Life is a collection of moments. It's how you manage the moments that makes the difference. My thanks again to Terry Gannon for joining me on today's episode. And thank you for listening. You can find more information about the Manage the Moment podcast in the episode notes for this broadcast. And you can subscribe to Manage the Moment podcast wherever you choose to listen to podcasts. You can find us also on social media. And you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shep. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to these moments with us. Until next time. On our next episode, we will be chatting with Mitchie Brusco, X Games gold medalist. Those moments, those two, I think, 
stick out to me a lot. And it's funny because neither of those are external. It's funny, like I realize that it's just like decisions that I made. But I mean, I guess unless it's a traumatic experience, that's going to be what transformations kind of are. Yeah. And I'm sure you're going to really enjoy what he has to say. Until next time. <laughs>